So this is going to be <laughs> really awkward looking. Um, and it's just due to the fact that I have a super old computer and uh, and I, I basically kind of fudging how to do this. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the purpose of this video is you're about to make a maker video and I hope that uh, you go through this and you get a chance to see kind of what I'm looking for. So uh, if anybody in any of my art classes can do a maker video, you can find somebody to interview and this is the format I would like you to use. And if you're going to just make a video um, and you're not in my class, I super appreciate it. But uh, this is kind of like meant for my students who are going to go out and try to interview makers. This is the part where I am acting as an interviewer to interview myself, just as an example of how to do the maker videos. So the idea here is that you're making a video and you're interviewing um, a beater or an elder and if you're from uh, Churchill Community School, which is property of Churchill High, it's me, hi, it's Miss Wool, or if you're just, you're a really generous person who's decided that you're okay with having a video on our YouTube channel, this is sort of the format. I want to try and make things easier for people to make a video and to make the videos so that I can use them in future classes. So the black and white images you're seeing of me, that's me being the teacher, teaching how to do the interview. And then the color images of me and my hands and stuff, that's just me being interviewed, right? So I don't have anyone at home who can operate the camera. My, my mom is in her 70s, she's not going to be using the iPhone, she doesn't want to. So, um, so this is an experiment. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so the first questions that you want to ask are um, the intro questions. And so the intro questions we're looking at are, the first one kind of is like, you know, obviously the person's name, how they want to be known, like their pronouns, how they, how they, how they identify, um, and their cultural background. And the second part of what you want to say is, or you want to ask is like, who taught them how to bead, first taught them how to bead, and um, how long they've been beading. And that's kind of like part of it, because these videos aren't meant to just be about um, technique. It's to show that beading is an integral part of, of sort of like a way of life. And for a lot of people, it's very, very personal, and it is for me too. So, so that's the teacher me showing you how to do the video part, and then the next part will be me being interviewed. I don't know. I'll try. I'm trying. So then the next part is obviously me being interviewed. So um, so my name is Sarah Catherine Poole. I'm she, her, and I'm from La Ronge, Saskatchewan. I grew up uh, in different places in the north. My uh, we lived in on, on reserves mainly because my parents were teachers in the north. My mom is British, mostly Irish, um, and she married my dad in Africa, and then they ended up in northern Saskatchewan. And uh, I was raised mainly in Larange, on Lake, Pelican Arrows, and um, my background is mostly Welsh or Celtic, um, and I've been privileged in a lot of ways, but I've been really privileged to grow up in Woodlands Cree territory and to be taught beating and to have grown up, you know, in the bush. I'm really, um, I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful that uh, I was included as a part of the community growing up and that uh, people have been so awesome, basically, uh, f especially so who first taught me how to bead um her name was ida trombley ida is a cree woman who she taught beading at my school and um and she i miss her a lot she uh so i first took a beading class with her while well, i took a moccasin making class and then i never i kept dropping it i kept being busy or i was sick and when i was a kid a lot of 
people's like my friend's cook come tried to teach me and her and we just didn't have the patience sometimes when you're a kid you just you know you want to move around and you don't want to sit and be not every kid wants to do that so uh so it wasn't until I was in my 30s I took a class with Ida and then uh for seven years every year she would see me around town she would say like when are you gonna come in and finish your moccasins and she she kept them she she kept them for me she was like no you you need to finish them and uh and so then in the seventh year she said you know I'm getting older and if you want to learn from me you need to come in like we we need to do this now so uh so anyway so I'm glad I did I'm super glad I did um so I I finally finished those moccasins and and uh, I was working on beading and stuff and she said you know you know you're you're not a very good moccasin maker and I I'm still working on that, but she said, you're a good beater, and, and you should keep doing that. And, you know, when an elder tells you that you're good at something, that's an amazing thing. And, uh, gosh, I didn't think this would be so emotional. But, uh, but yeah, so that's who taught me how to beat, and since then, I've looked at so many different uh, YouTube videos and learning from YouTube videos, and I'm, I'm super privileged because as an art teacher, I can have elders come in and I learn from everybody and I love it and, and it's really my passion uh, you know like I I got really sick like a couple years back and I was home for like over a year and I couldn't move I couldn't do anything and beating honest to God it was my sanity <laughs> and it, it uh, it's my medicine because it's something that you can just calm down and concentrate and and it's beautiful and you can make things for other people. I don't have a lot of examples to show um, because I like I mostly make things for other people. I don't sell my beadwork. Um, I just make stuff. So so that's my answer to those two questions. Okay, so the next questions. Hey, so the next questions usually you would ask them while they're beating and you would like focus in on their hands um, a lot of beaters they don't want their face in there they just want to show off the beadwork and so it, it's fine to ask all of these questions and and we can watch them bead it's kind of nice to just see experienced people beating so the questions that we have for this part next two questions are um, do you use single needle or do you use double needle? And hopefully they're actually going to like show you their technique so you can see that. And ask them, what do you think makes the difference between, you know, great beadwork and kind of like okay beadwork? Like how do you know it's like a really good beading? So those are the next two questions. So my kind of answers for those that I have, I'll just turn the light on here so you can see what I'm going to show you first. So there's there's sort of a uh, a thing, uh, <laughs> there's a debate I guess in the community about single needle versus double needle. I use both. So this is a thing that I'm doing that I can talk about in a little bit. But basically the advantage to double needle for me is that I use it when I am figuring out a pattern and what I'll do is is what I would call almost lazy double needle like you're supposed to do it every like two three but what I do when I'm figuring something out is I'll very often just kind of like very lightly come in and and tack my stuff in kind of where I think I I know how it's gonna lie and this isn't like the final form at all <laughs> so I'll come in like and I'll tack over and I'll kind of like just lay the beads uh, where I want them to be. And then later on, when I come in and tighten things up, that's when I come in and I use like a, a single needle technique. So what I'm currently working on right now, and I'll, I'll do a little thing on these because they're really fun to make at Christmas. This is obviously, this is, this is the gender bred person. Um, that I'm working on right now for um, because our our GSA kids are missing pride in June so I want to make them some badges so and that's just a I'll do a video on these because they're easy to make and at Christmas time I make them for friends and family and you can just you can 
customize them however you want and you can like like if your friend is well my brother and his wife got married I I did like wedding ones and I made a bride and a groom and uh they're just a nice easy thing to do if you have scraps of moose hide um I'm getting distracted right so really good beating not mine as much <laughs> I don't think I'm a great beater I think I'm getting there but we'll see so this is a jacket from 1980 and if you look at it here's what I think is really great about it so this jacket was made uh, for my mom or sorry it wasn't made for my mom it was made for my dad in La Lash when he was uh, teaching up there and you can see that there's lots of room for the beads and when I run my finger across these beads nothing is sticking up like it's just it's just like flat and the, there's nothing pushing against each other too much. Uh, this person, this is, and the other thing that makes great beading is that this is this person's design. And the, so like when I first started teaching, I actually did my internship my first uh, three, four years in Lalash. When I went there with this jacket, the ladies there were able to tell me that the jacket wasn't actually from Lalash. They could tell from these leaves, that's the Turner style leaves. So Turner Lake is a mixed Cree Dene community that's a little further south from Lalash. And they could tell by these little white things and these swirls, right, who made the jacket. Because she had this distinctive style that was her her style, her signature, her thing that she did. And 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 there's so in the north there's certain ways of doing um, leaves or, or, or beads. Like if you look at older work where you can actually, you could, you could say, okay, this comes from that community. Now because of the internet, you know, we're all sharing ideas and stuff. And so you don't get that as much. But I think really great bead work. It has all of these things. And it also has a personal style. Like somebody has worked out the best way that they can do a flower. And, and they've, they've that's what they do that's their thing because uh and the other thing about it especially about um the style that we have up here is that most of the beadwork is done to be done on clothing that is used you know in in weather like so you know this jacket this is the yoke of the jacket and so like this jacket has been through a lot i'm trying to revive it because uh None of us are skinny enough to wear it anymore. <laughs> and also because the some of the hide on the bottom parts are not as good. But the placement of the flowers on the yoke where they know it's not going to get racked. The fact that, you know, my dad wore it and my I've worn it and my brother wore it and, and it's still in great shape. Like, that is, that's amazing technique. So, that's what I, that's what I aspire to, I guess. I would say as far as technique goes so next question so the next two questions that you want to get at and you know uh, if people get really passionate about these things you can kind of like just focus on, on on their face or something but if they just want to talk over their beating that's fine too are um, well advice and it's really nice to have advice so however that looks, whatever advice they're willing to give us for beginner beaters, like what what do you recommend? And you could do that as an interview. Um, and then the question that I want you guys to ask is like, is it okay for beginner beaters to copy your work for personal use, not for selling? Um, like so if, if someone's making a pattern are they okay with beginner beaters trying to attempt that pattern or not? Because we, the last thing we want is for these videos to be like an excuse for people to like steal people's ideas and intellectual property. That's not okay. That's not what we're teaching in our classes. So yeah, so I am obviously, obviously I'm good with people using my work. I'm making a whole video tutorial about every single thing that I show you here. So like if you want to learn how to make the, the gingerbread people, uh, I'll have a tutorial on that. 
And if you're interested in trying to make like a Celtic, the, I've been playing around with a, a bunch, this Celtic theme and the idea of using kind of like moose hide to because it's where I'm from and, and it's a smell that I grew up with and there's nothing like it to make you feel like secure. Uh, so I'll do I'll do a video on that. Like so obviously I, I want to share this stuff. So yeah, anything that I show you, obviously I'm good with anybody using it. Um, and that's really kind of like that's that's kind of it. Uh, I think it's okay to do for personal use, um, and that's kind of what I try and teach. It's different if you're selling it. So question seven is going to be probably the biggest part of the video because you're going to ask them to show you a signature move or a tip or a technique and you're going to be really focusing on it on their hands and uh, on what they're doing. So that's like the bulk of your video. Yeah, so obviously I'm going to be doing a bunch of techniques and videos to, to show you but um, so the, I don't know if it's a technique, but it's a, it's a project that I'm kind of like playing with. I've been making earrings out of this and it's, uh, I'm going to decrease the light here. It's just like super, super bright and see very well. So maybe the white just doesn't show very good. Oh, there we go. So this is like, I've been learning brick stitch and... I've also been playing around with making um, kind of like Celtic knots and using peyote stitch. It's, it's all about just learning. So these are going to be earrings. I'm going to make earrings like this. And I was playing around with putting beads along the back and then I realized that the beads I was using were the same color as my skin so they were just not showing up very well. So I am going to make like, and, and the big thing that I do, the, I guess my signature thing, is that I like to use different kinds of beads. I'm always doing different stuff with, these are my favorite kind of beads to that inform what I'm doing. So that's going to be my signature thing, is like showing how to use these super duos as an applique. Because I don't see a lot of people doing that, so I think that's what I have to contribute. So the next question that I want you to ask them, and um, you can record their faces or their hands or whatever, I just want it to be very, very clear what we're doing on this channel. And the question is, is it, like, are you okay with non-Indigenous students learning these techniques from you? And if the answer is no, we're not putting it on the channel, period. We're not going to broadcast it. We're not going to put it on the Facebook page or the Instagram or anything. Um, and there are good reasons for this, all right? So, number one, there is, and we'll talk about this in class, there is a huge, huge history of um, Indigenous people's work and women's work being unnamed, being stolen, being uncredited in art history and, and in fashion. We've got whole units about this. Two, I'm non-Indigenous, so if Ida had not wanted to teach me, like I can understand why people would, would look and be like, oh, you know, like why is this white woman teaching beating? I was like, well, it's, you know, it's, I get where people are coming from from that. Part of growing up a white person, you know, in an Indigenous community is owning your privilege. Like, yeah. Um, so that means that I get that people have stitches and things that they don't want to pass on. They only want to pass on within their family. So that doesn't mean you can't videotape your grandma or your grandpa or gukum, mushum, habahama, like whoever you, you do and, and make these videos for your own family's use, you know, like uh, the older generation is getting older. And so... I would encourage you to do that, and if you do, and if you just show it to me, don't send it to me, but if you just show it to me, and you're in my class, you can, you, these videos are an opportunity for you to get an extra credit, so you can still get an extra credit, but if the person is not okay with 
their knowledge being shared with a broader audience. Like 30% of our students are non-Indigenous. We have a bigger and bigger Filipino community. And so like, if you're not okay, if the person is not okay with sharing their knowledge with outside of their own culture and their own family, then we have to respect that. You absolutely have to respect that. Okay, so just to be 100% clear on this. So um, it's kind of obviously I meant that question to it's it's definitely directed at indigenous makers. The majority of beaters that I've met are indigenous, um, and like I think like so I try and use this is an Art Nouveau uh, book that I'm just ordered. And I'm super thrilled with that I got, and like I try and use you know I I, I don't want to use somebody somebody's pattern that could be you know theft right I, do, I don't want to be using and I think that it's fair to go to settler culture or European culture or art history I think it's totally legit to say okay look this is this awesome tile it's an art nouveau tile and and it's it's I would use this as a pattern, and, and I have zero problems with using it as a pattern because there's a difference between taking from a dominant culture, like like the Western, kind of basically white or European dominant culture, and taking from cultures that, like getting ideas from cultures that are traditionally mar marginalized and then like co-opting them. And you certainly should not be using, you know, religious symbols if you're not religious. Like, I wouldn't beat a cross. Maybe I would beat a cross for somebody who is really Christian. But, like, I myself am not Christian. So, I, I'm not going to use that symbology. I, you know, it's pretty basic. And I, I think that these are discussions that we have a lot in class. And it's good to get people's thinking on that, you know. So, there's certain things that people... There's a history of, like, books being written and people just learning the technique and not learning the culture. So, you know, oh, this is a cool design, I want to beat it. And, and then they sell it. And that's kind of like an issue. So I think that when you're, when you're doing that, you really need to be careful about it. We need to at least have a conversation about it. I, I don't have the answers to that. Everybody's got to decide that on their own. But we definitely, it's something to, to talk about. Oops, why am I upside down? All right, next question. So the next two questions um, I would ask maybe at the end of the video, more like. And the first one is, um, do you, like ask the person, do you sell your work? And if you do sell, if they say yes, ask them how they price it because that's useful information to find out and we're going to do a lesson on how people price their work and how you know traditionally people are being you know there are people who will buy up indigenous people's work and resell it like 400 percent higher uh in some fancy place somewhere else um and also what online platforms they might be using to sell their work some people sell like just on Facebook or direct messenger like how are people using the internet to uh, to market their work and to sell their work and as part of that conversation also please ask them um, is it this is oh, actually that's a really separate kind of conversation but is it ever acceptable for someone to use your cultural or personal patterns um, and copy it to sell not because they're just trying to learn it, but like copying what you're making and selling it. And um, what about if people use images of your work, right? And the reason I want you to ask them this is because we, do, we have like whole lessons on this and, and it's part of a unit on cultural appropriation of indigenous art and women's art that we do in our art classes. So, uh, and if they don't want to, you know, get into it, that that's fine. But it would be really cool if you could ask some um, answers to those questions. It's super important we talk about that. You know, there's there's been um, 
I don't want to get into the whole lesson, but like there is an issue with people copying things or there is an issue within the community where uh, even friends of mine would say like they'd send me a picture and they'd be like, hey, can you make this? Like, yeah, I probably could. Am I gonna? No, no, you should buy it from that person. And yeah, so that's that's a whole thing. But just make sure and ask those two questions. And then make sure at the end of your video that you thank them so, so much for, for giving of their time and their knowledge to us. Um, because we're trying to build like a bank of knowledge here. So that future generations uh, are going to know how to bead and have that and, and keep that going on and moving on and moving up. Yeah, so um, obviously, I, 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 the, the only thing that I have to add to that, because obviously I did a ton of talking, is that I, I think that if you want to look at, you know, like, like, basically, I don't see why anyone would get mad about taking, like, a Celtic thing, like, a Celtic knot or, or anything like that, because, like, really, when you look at it, it's the, it's, it's not a culture that's under threat, okay? It's not. No matter what those idiots will try and say um there's there's no way it's under threat it's like it's like disney going after beaters who beat baby yoga yoda um and they're suing them it's it's ridiculous like you're a multinational corporation you make a ton of money and you're gonna go after an independent beater and my other thinking about this is this is like when you go to like a when you go to the chicago art museum you are allowed to reproduce by hand as long as you credit the work. So, like, if I went in there, there was a Magritte uh, exhibit, and if I went in there, I wasn't allowed to take photographs, but I was allowed to draw it. I can take a sketch of it. And as long as I say, this is a sketch of this, and, and you cite that painting, then you're following the rules. So, like, if you sell a photograph of a painting, and you say, this is painting is by this artist, and that painting was on public display, like uh, a lot of street art is, right? If you sell a picture of street art, that's, you can do that. That's fine. I don't sell my work at all at this point in my life. I don't, teaching is, is where it's at. I make a good living doing it, and, and uh, I still feel like I'm learning, and I don't know that I really have a style yet. So anything I show on here, I am totally fine with people copying, even for commercial use, as long as uh, I'm going to put a proviso on that for commercial use if you are indigenous, because I think that that would be a way of, of uh, trying to give back, <laughs> I guess, um, in a way, right? So like, I, I really don't make you know, traditional indigenous design, unless it's for somebody who is indigenous as a gift. So, like, I've done Métis flowers for a Métis friend like that, you know. Um, but, yeah, I'm fine with people copying my stuff. But if you want to take the time to make these things after I've shown you the video on how to do it and, and the money is going to you, that's fine. Just please credit me and say, like, oh, yeah, Sarah Poole made this up. <laughs> that's about it so that is how to make the the interviews or the the maker interview videos for my students and for anybody else who wants to contribute a video just to kind of give an idea of a format so that was a super long lesson it's like half an hour of talking I hope you paused lots and you know got some water or something so that's it for that video